Welcome, everybody, uh, to this week's installment of the uh, College of Engineering, the UAA College of Engineering seminar. Um, my name is Scott Hamill. I am the chair of the Department of Civil Engineering, and we have, I believe, for the third week in a row, uh, a, a civil engineering presenter. Um, we're very excited this week to have uh, Dr. Paul um, Janky. Is it Janky or Jank? Janky. Janky, okay. Um, and Paul has been uh, with the Alaska Department of Transportation um, and Public Facilities uh, for a long time. I'm not going to dwell on years um, uh, as the regional hydrologist. Um, and so, uh, Paul, I will let you introduce yourself a little more than that, if you like, um, and I'll let you take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Scott. Um, my name is Paul Janke. Uh, I work for the state of Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities. I, uh, although my my working title is regional hydrologist, I'm a, really a. Uh, that's because of uh, historical reasons. I am a, a licensed civil engineer in Alaska, and I have a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and PhD in civil engineering. Um, uh, so. Uh, and my specialty is hydraulic engineering, and I do a lot of work with um, streams, uh, erosion protection, and designing um, larger culverts uh, for uh, a DOT. I've had this job for quite a while, so um, I've accumulated some slides, so hopefully we can go through some of those today. Uh, okay, let me... Uh, start out. Um, uh, I, I'm really going to talk about uh, braided rivers, but we'll start with the basics and say that um, streams are generally classified into three uh, groups, uh, straight streams, meandering streams, and braided streams. These don't have any distinct boundaries. They're just uh, some groups that have roughly similar characteristics. So I won't dwell on that. Um, <clears throat> straight streams are very uncommon. You don't see them very often. Uh, a stream might be straight if it has a steep uh, longitudinal slope coming down a steep hillside, for example, or streams that do not flow in their own alluvium. Uh, alluvium is the material that the stream bed is made out of. Uh, if the stream moved that material into that current location, then the stream can move it to some other location. But if this there's uh, if it's not if that stream bed material is not placed by uh, the stream, or the stream characteristics have changed uh, over the, the millennia or a long period of time and it may not be able to move that material. So now it, it's not flowing in its own alluvium, so it can't move it. So it's generally, um, uh, it can be uh, straight or at least it doesn't change horizontal alignment. Um, uh, these are also in, located in headwater reaches, like I said, on steep slopes. Um, Meandering streams are very common. You see these all over. If you're like me, you're always gawking out the window and looking at them when you drive down the road. Um, these typically have lower slopes than uh, straight uh, streams. Um, they are typically have a one channel, although that's not always the case. If there, there's places where there's islands in the in the river that, due to some erosion or some other uh, cause, earthquake or whatever, um, there's there there's more than one uh, channel. But for the most part, braided or uh, meandering streams have one channel. Um, uh, meandering streams uh, generally flow in their own alluvium, which means they move the sediment there so they can move it out. And, uh, uh, and so the, that sediment 
is uh, uh, regularly moved, and not during the lower discharges, but during the moderate and larger discharges, it uh, regularly moves. Um, <clears throat> if a, an alluvial stream, and occasionally you see this, or a meandering stream has a straight section that's over five to seven channel widths, then it it is um, it has to be held. It, that that's an indication that the sediment it can't the set this the meandering stream cannot move that sediment. Uh, naturally occurring meandering streams flowing in their own alluvium. Uh, virtually always have straight reaches that are less than this five to seven channel widths. Uh, so if you're an engineer and looking at a stream and you see it a long straight stretch and it, it's probably pretty coarse and it, maybe it's not going to move very much in the life of your project, or at least you can start out with that assumption. Um, uh, <clears throat> In most meandering streams, there they don't have uh, their alignment uh, uh, for very long. They're constantly moving, and they do this by eroding the uh, stream bed material and stream bank material on the outside of the bend, which means that if it's a left-turning meander. Always looking down, I always look downstream. So if it's turning to the left as you're looking downstream, then that bend is on the right where it is probably eroding and unless uh, the, the, stream, the um, stream can't move that, but generally it can. Uh, and it tends to erode more on the downstream portion of that uh, meander bend. So this, <laughs> is one way that um, streams meander and perpetuate that meander pattern because they're constantly eroding on the outside. Let me switch to the next slide here. They're eroding on the outside and <clears throat> in a... a um, curve uh, on a meandering stream, there is a super elevation on the water surface. Now, if it's flowing really slow, you're probably not going to notice it uh, unless maybe you got a, a sensitive survey uh, e piece of equipment. But if it's a moderate or fast flowing stream, it's super elevated, which means the water surface elevation on the outside of the stream is higher than on the inside of the or stream or the left side. If you have a, if the stream is uh, curving to the left, then it's higher on the right and lower on the left. So what does that do? Well, if it's higher on the higher outside, there is a vertical component to the water velocity uh, and that, um, because it's higher uh, on the on the one side, you a vortex is formed, and so the water uh, there is a secondary component to the water velocity that is across the stream. Now this is a uh, 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 has a lower velocity and is generally not as um, uh, fast as the the longitudinal movement in the stream. So it doesn't just move straight across the river. It's a helix that's formed going in the down, flowing in the downstream direction. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so the, <clears throat> the, uh, this will cause uh, in the uh, in the uh, the straight section between the the uh, meanders. Uh, there's uh, the there generally is still a a component of the velocity perpendicular to the main flow, and in the curves, 
anybody that looks at streams, you know that on the inside of a curve on a meandering stream, there is a, a section of the stream that's higher elevation, the section of the stream bed that's higher elevation than on the outside of a band. And what causes that? That's caused by this helical flow and the secondary flow uh, moves sediment up into the uh, on the inside of a bend, and that we typically call that a point bar. You see those all the time. That is very common. So that's a good way to know there's a secondary flow in the stream. <clears throat> Let me go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've talked about this secondary current commonly cause erosion on the stream bed, which creates a scour hole on the outside of the curve and a point bar or higher elevation of the stream bed on the inside of a curve. So this is the reason that's because of this, uh, the secondary current. Uh, so due to the secondary current bank erosion locations and constantly and consequently bank erosion locations that need to be protected uh, to, so it doesn't damage critical infrastructure in my case, um, <clears throat> can be approximately predicted where it's going to occur. Because it, it always occurs during the out, at the outside of these uh, bends, generally near the downstream portion of that. So these can be generally predicted. The meanders bends move downstream and, and they can move uh, horizontal as well. It depends on other situations such as uh, stream bank material and slope of the stream and all that. There's many variables. But <clears throat> so anyway, these meandering streams, the erosion can be generally, uh, location can be generally uh, predicted. Now we get into braided streams. This is what uh, I really wanted to talk about today because they're, uh, they cause uh, DOT lots of problems uh, because, uh, well, first let me say they occur in locations that are typically uh, downstream of glaciers and because glaciers are typically releasing lots of sediment. And so there's more sediment typically than the water uh, can carry. So it, uh, it, it it increases the uh, stream width, and there's uh, in, and it's not just one channel. There's uh, braided streams have numerous um, uh, smaller channels. So if you happen to drive by uh, a meandering stream like the uh, uh, Matanuska River um, or others like the Susitna River, and you take a look, you can see numerous channels are very wide. Um, they they uh, sometimes have um, uh, immature vegetation in the in this uh, in this braided section of the stream, but they don't really don't get to uh, a mature stage because the rivers move so much sediment that they get knocked over or eroded before they get too large. Um, so let's see what else I had. Stream, braided streams are typically very wide compared to meandering streams. Um, <clears throat> and they have numerous independent channels. The braided streams they are frequently downstream of glaciers. Um, the sediment deposition uh, be, uh, occurs uh, generally because the streams flatten and the stream carries, uh, there's more sediment moving upstream than can be moved downstream. So they frequently change locations and these uh, uh, numerous braided channels are constantly changing. Uh, they have constantly changing their width, slope, uh, sediment characteristics, a roughness and the discharge they're they're moving all the time um, <clears throat> and you don't have to wait too long you can go early in the season and go back later in the season at a similar discharge and uh, generally they're 
significant the stream's characteristics are significantly different. Um, so this last bullet here is that the stream channels frequently uh, converge, diverge, and change their whole horizontal location. Uh, and so the hydraulic characteristics are really not very predictable. And <clears throat> so let me switch to the next slide. We're getting into the main part of the talk dealing with uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, uh, some channels, uh, these uh, channels in the meandering, in the uh, uh, braided streams, they meander a little bit. Uh, uh, it can be a uh, can be both meandering and a small small meandering and small braided, uh, but they're constantly changing, like I said. And uh, <clears throat> so now let's get into um, why this is important to uh, DOT infrastructure. Is that we've all heard of the equation force equals mass times acceleration, but for hydraulic engineers, that's rho q delta v rho is the density q is the discharge generally uh, in cubic feet per second and the delta v is the change in velocity vector those bold uh, letters are because those are vectors they have both a magnitude and a direction uh, <clears throat> so the um, the force on a bank uh, typically occur when these uh, forces uh, are larger. And that typically happens when there's a larger discharge and a larger change in the velocity vector hitting the bank. In other words, the bank has to, <coughs> has to redirect uh, the velocity or or uh, erosion is caused. So <clears throat> this is what I generally look for when I'm inspecting these braided rivers to determine if they're a near-term threat to uh, the DOT road infrastructure is look for uh, larger discharges and larger changes in velocity vectors. Um, but just because you see it one time uh, doesn't mean it's going to continue uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, these uh, meandering channels are constantly changing. And so uh, you can, it's very difficult to predict with any accuracy um, when that erosion is going to be a problem uh, for some infrastructure and even though and even if it's going to happen uh, how how big of a problem is it going to be uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see locations where the matanuska river or other braided streams cause erosive portions is a concern to dot so I get asked to take a look at these streams and I'd like to do it. It's good to do it in the uh, summer during some moderate discharge, but it's also a very good idea. I'd like to do it in October when the uh, discharge in these uh, streams is very low. And so typically there's not a lot of water flowing next to the outer bank. And so it's easy to see what the bank actually looks like. Is what material is in it? Um, uh, is it very erodible? That sort of thing. So um, my, I try to take a look at these streams in the summer, but I do that anyway, just driving around for work. But um, I also like to do it in uh, say mid-October. Uh, when there's very little to no water flowing uh, adjacent to the river. Normally on the Matanuska River, these locations are along the Glen Highway. Uh, and those locations are about mile 63 to 80. 
So that's a significant stretch that we look at uh, regularly. And along the old Glen Highway, and this is roughly from the uh, old Glen Highway bridge across the Matanuska River downstream to about uh, Mod Road, which is, I don't know, uh, three miles or something like that. We've had some serious erosion problems there uh, in the last uh, recent past, and here I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> yeah, adjacent to the old Glen Highway in the Butte area downstream of the Matanuska River Bridge, um, uh, there's a section of stream um, uh, near Leeside Circle, if you're familiar with that area, that uh, several years ago, uh, I don't remember, like 2013 or 14 or 15 or something like that, where the, uh, it was unprecedented. We were very surprised. The Matanuska River eroded 270 feet of the bank towards the old Glen Highway. And so we had to scurry a little bit to, um, uh, we weren't expecting that much erosion. So we had to scurry to get a project to protect that. Um, uh, fortunately, we were able to do that. And the stream uh, in the last 15 years, the uh, Matanuska River has been on or close to that left bank as you're looking downstream by the old Glen Highway. But just a year ago, it's moved over to the other side of the uh, of the floodplain. So now it's over in the Palmer area by the Palmer Airport. Um, uh, it, but I don't know why. I uh, this, I guess it's because the stream, like I said before, the uh, Matanuska River, wherever there's flowing water, there's sediment, and it can't carry all the sediment, so it's being deposited. So that's why these uh, numerous channels are created and and uh, filled in regularly. So maybe it'll stay over to that right side for a while, and and uh, the city of Palmer will have to deal with it. Um, let's see what's this last. Due to the frequency of the Matanuska River forces adjacent to the Glen High and Old Glen Highway change, and the erosion protection cost erosion locations of concern are monitored. So we regularly take a look at these every year just to make sure there's no uh, damage pending. Because it's a very, very dynamic system. These braided rivers are very dynamic because of the sediment deposition. Uh, <clears throat> so here's some uh, erosion protection details that uh, we generally uh, try to follow. Um, uh, we generally use uh, riprap uh, for, because it's uh, normally the rock is uh, available, but it's also because uh, the riprap is made up of individual stones and they, they are flexible. So if there's some uh, log or something redirects water into <coughs> into a portion of the riprap and, and moves a, a stone out, uh, the, the uh, nearby stone will generally fall into its place. Uh, so it tends to be self-healing uh, that way. So that's a, a good reason uh, for riprap. And you'd say, well, if it loses one stone, well, maybe maybe it's exposing the bank somewhere else. Well, the riprap is typically uh, two uh, layers thick. So you uh, determine what size riprap you need and then roughly multiply it by two. This is kind of the standard that is in all the literature and we've been following and it seems to work fairly well. Uh, for the Matanuska River, um, of course, the size of the rock tends to uh, de is determined by the this uh, force that I said rho q delta v. It's the discharge and the change in the velocity vector changes that causes that force. So we try to estimate that, and 
and then estimate the uh, size of the rock that's uh, not going to be moved by that uh, design event. Uh, uh, normally these stones are in the Matanuska River are about two feet size, only they're not round. <clears throat> A rounded rock would tend to roll and move, but and you don't want that. You want they're they're angular, so they will lock together uh, very well. So they tend to be a uh, blocky. Um, with a with according to the literature, they recommend uh, the uh, ratio of the longest to the shortest axis is is less than three. You don't want it too round. You don't want it flat. Uh, it, so it tends to be blocky. Um, the, the average stone shape is about, uh, is, that is used for calculations is about 80% of a cube. And the stone specific gravity is Normally around 2.65, that's uh, a rock that is readily available, although sometimes we find some that are a little bit lower and we go down to something like 2.55, that's about as low as you want to get for a specific gravity. It's hard to find something less than that unless you're in some uh, unique area. Uh, we don't really have these in the Alaska Peninsula. We have some of that rock volcanic origin that tends to be pretty light, but around here it tends to be a very good rock. Uh, has that a specific gravity. And so the uh, stone weight is calculated. Uh, I've got that um, equation there. Uh, 0.85% of a cube, so 0.85 d cubed, d is the side of a cube, uh, multiplied by the um, uh, sediment or the riprap uh, a specific weight. And, uh, and normally the uh, rock is, as a, is 2.65 times uh, unit weight at times water. So it's 2.65 times 62.4. And for this, uh, <clears throat> uh, what we call class three riprap, uh, the, aver the average weight of a stone is like 1120 pounds or thereabouts. So these are big pieces of rock uh, that, and we want them angular. Uh, because they tend to lock together very well. So if one if one starts rocking a little bit, it'll just rock into a, another adjacent stone. So they tend to be uh, more stable that way if they're angular. And the slope, uh, the air face slope is generally around two to one. If you get it too steeper than that, then it, it can, uh, uh, if it, rocks too much, it'll fall vertically down into the stream, whereas this is a little bit flatter. Uh, it's been determined uh, uh, over the years by people before me that that um, uh, something flatter than two to one is probably not necessary. Uh, we've had very good success using this uh, two to one slope. <clears throat> um, See. Yeah, let's see. Okay, uh, rose protection details uh, for this. Uh, uh, normally, the uh, minimum uh, thickness of the riprap is twice some average uh, uh, size of the rock. So, this, what DOT calls class three riprap, it's about a, a two foot size. So we want a four foot minimum uh, a distance measured perpendicular to that two to, two to one slope. And so that way you get uh, two layers of rock, although it's, there's no uh, shear plane, it's, it's lo all locked together, angular. Um, however, if the riprap is placed underwater, 
the operator can't really see what they're doing. And so uh, the uh, recommendation in the national publications is what we use. Uh, it's that rock uh, uh, thickness, the same size rock, but the thickness is increased by 50%. Uh, normally, the thickness is twice that um, is twice the average riprap size. So, if the two feet rock is uh, normally a two foot is a four foot thick erosion protection blanket, but if it's in a uh, place underwater, we increase that to about uh, six feet uh, because you the operator can't really see what they're doing. If you can. Wait, you don't have to do it during uh, high water. If you can wait till the uh, in the fall or winter when the water's down and you can see the operator can see what they're doing, then we can get away with uh, that four foot thick. But uh, quite often, or, or at least sometimes, we have to place it during high water. So that's so we have to do that, increase the stone thickness. Um, the, the riprap is angular, so it tends to lock together so they don't roll on one another. Um, it's, it's, it's not, and we want, well, here, I think that's the next slide. Uh, riprap is used because it is flexible. So if you get two layers and the rock starts um, moving around over the time, it will not lock together as well. So a stone could be dislodged, but the it's the nearby stones can and frequently do uh, uh, fill in that void. Now you've got a small section that is has a thinner uh, 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 riprap section than you would uh, like, but it's self somewhat self healing. So that's another reason why riprap is selected because it is self-healing. Um, let me go to the next one. This is my last slide. Um, the top of the riprap is uh, typically at the riverbank elevation or above. Uh, uh, typically we do not want uh, water to get over the riprap, and then they'll just start eroding the bank behind it. So that's normally what we do. If we're uh, sure the water is never going to get that high, um, then we might. But typically, uh, uh, the bank height is is uh, created by the stream, so it it um, it's a good indication that the that the water will get to that elevation occasionally. So normally we go to that elevation unless it's just uh, seems inappropriate. The bottom of the riprap is placed below the expected scour elevation. So we can get scour and the, and the, the riprap is not dis, destabilized. Uh, this is, this is uh, not an exact science to determine what that scour depth is going to be. There's just too many variables uh, because you could have, especially in a braided river, the river can create these various channels that redirect the water perpendicular into the bank or the river erodes the bank and then you have some a significant tree that falls into the river and that can redirect the water perpendicular into the bank. And then that's a larger force than if it's flowing parallel to the bank, obviously. So uh, that scour depth is, is uh, uh, an approximate number that uh, we use and we try to be a little bit conservative because it's it's expensive to do this work. So you might as well uh, uh, design it so it doesn't have to be reconstructed in the near future. Um, the, uh, the last project we did in the Old Glen Highway area, downstream of the uh, uh, Old Glen Highway Bridge, um, we paid 
$2,000 a lineal foot to protect the river. And it wasn't, it was like 11 foot high bank. So it was pretty, pretty tall, but that was pretty expensive. That was more than we'd uh, paid in the past, paid for in the past. Um, um, not just, not only um, uh, erosion protection on the, on the bank right where we're expecting the scour, but we also extend it upstream and downstream, especially in these braided rivers. And we watch it, like I was saying, we regularly monitor where the water is flowing and when we need to put erosion protection in. The erosion protection is, is fairly expensive at $2,000 a lineal foot. So we try to wait as long as possible until we're sure we absolutely need to put it in. Um, I don't, because we don't want to put it in and then have the river move somewhere else. Uh, and these braided rivers do that. Um, meandering rivers are different. They typically erode on the outside of the meander band, just a little bit past the peak of the band. Uh, so you don't need to uh, protect significant lengths of the stream, but a braided river is different because you can't really predict where that stream is going to hit the bank. These are the outer banks are fairly straight. Uh, the the inner channels uh, are can meander. Um, frequently they do, uh, but uh, and when they get to the to the uh, when you get these um, uh, channels next to the bank, uh, then we um, <clears throat> then we uh, we, we protect the riverbank upstream and downstream. Now, if I can turn off this stop share. Uh, can I do that and show some pictures that I have? Uh, yeah, the best way to do that is actually to hit escape on your keyboard. Okay, there, and okay. Be able to get to it. Get to my, okay, that's, let me see. Where did I put these? Glen Highway. Oh, never mind. Oh, here. Put them here. That's right. Move this over. Oh, moved the wrong one over. Okay, never mind. Okay, uh, so here's I've got a number of pictures. This is. Um, we talked a lot about the Matanuska River, uh, <clears throat> the uh, braided section of the Matanuska River. But this is in Girdwood on Glacier Creek, just downstream of the airport. This happened a couple of years ago. It was kind of a surprise. And you can see how the banks is fairly vertical. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think this happened a couple of years ago. Here's uh, <clears throat> the Matanuska River uh, right near uh, uh, 63, mile 63 on the Glen Highway, looking upstream. And you can see, you get, uh, you get these banks, water can flow parallel to the banks. Parallel flow isn't so bad because it doesn't have the impinging flow. Uh, but this is a typical braided stream. You can see some portions get some vegetation, um, but they normally don't get very large because this uh, sediment is uh, fairly mobile. The river moves this. So you can see all the numerous channels. It's just constantly moving back and forth. Here's the Glen Highway on the left and we're looking upstream. Here's the similar location uh, looking downstream. Uh, we'll talk about, look at this section right here. Can, can you see my uh, cursor? Yes, we can. Okay, well, we'll look at that in a, in a minute. But you can see how these uh, channels are braided. Um, 
uh, the this section of the river next to the bank is not always in this location. It constantly moving. It just happened to be there this uh, late summer, early fall when these pictures were taken from a drone. So you can see how these channels. Some of them are moderate. Some of them are small. And they're constant and they're constantly changing. Uh, here's uh, the Glen Highway uh, looking uh, upstream again. Uh, same thing, very <clears throat> uh, numerous channels. They're constantly changing. If you walk out here uh, during low time, you see this sediment is kind of gravel to sandy material. It's easily eroded by these by the streams. One thing about braided streams compared to meandering streams is they're always fairly steep because you can see uh, uh, the individual channels uh, uh, are, uh, are uh, somewhat meandering, but the general uh, uh, braid plane is, does not, and so it tends to be fairly steep, steeper than meandering channels. So this gives you a good view of a braided channel. And <clears throat> now here, this location here, I pointed out before, um, I'll show some pictures. Uh, this happened very suddenly in 2009. And um, so we, uh, uh, it, it was late in 2009, so we decided to put this erosion protection in in the spring of 2010. So I'll show you some of those pictures. But look at this, just upstream of that, this, uh, so this eroded very quickly. This has been like this for quite a while. This is one area where we watch, and you can see it's getting pretty close to the Glen Highway. But for whatever reason, the stream has been avoiding this. And even though it's pretty, uh, a small distance to the road and there's really not much vegetation to hold it. It's just this grass. It really doesn't move. So that's one reason why we don't just go out and spend a $2,000 a lineal foot whenever we see that because we may not need it for a while. It's better to wait till we have to uh, spend that money. So uh, Here's another look, stream, uh, a view looking downstream. There's that section we protected in 2010 that became visible in 2009. Here, uh, because we were concerned that we were not gonna get out there in time, we put these super sacks in and you can see how close, you see the guardrail on the uh, Glen Highway. Um, this is, um, this was put in in 2010 and it's doing very well. Uh, um, so these super sacks were removed shortly after or, or during construction. There's another picture up. You can see how close it was um, to the behind the guardrail. The guardrail is supposed to have two feet behind it in order to function properly. Well, I don't think we had two feet there. So, and there's another view. You can see what this looked like in 2010. Remember the picture I showed earlier uh, that showed there was very little uh, vegetation here. And look now, and look 10 years later or earlier, there was a lot of vegetation. So we're expecting erosion problems here. Uh, that's this is one area where we regularly watch. Um, yeah, you can see there's um, wooded debris. A large, these tend, can be very large, lengthy and big root balls, and they can get floated. And if they get uh, next to the bank, they can direct the water and uh, cause impinging flow and and uh, significant erosion. So that has to be watched. And here's a picture uh, of that same area just before we put the super sacks in. And you can see how this was pretty close. This was closer than, than I like, but 
This was a recent picture taken, I think this last two years ago, I think. Uh, yeah, 2020. Um, this is what the river uh, can do. Uh, uh, this is within the, uh, the Magnus River is a braided uh, uh, river. So the, the channels are constantly moving back and forth. And so sometime in the past, uh, the river created this silty bank that's very erodible. This is, uh, and so uh, these, uh, I think the Matanuska Borough paid these people money to, re to allow them to remove these structures to get them out of the, out of the floodplain so they're not gonna fall into the river. Um, they've been buying people out in these areas. Uh, yeah, this is telling uh, that was that was uh, some serious erosion there. Gets me nervous. Well, I guess that's all my slides, and um, I uh, I have time for questions. If uh, uh, someone wants to ask questions or about this area or some other location. Uh, I talked about braided rivers because these are the most erosive. Uh, meandering streams do the same thing. They just do it on the outside of a bend. It's very localized. They do move. It's not nearly as drastic as this. Uh, so <clears throat> if you're buying a house, be cautious if you're buying an extra uh, 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 meandering river as well. <laughs> Um, Paul, I'll ask the first question. So my question, uh, so thank you. That was that was really um, interesting, especially for, um, uh, I'm, I'm a civil engineer who doesn't really do anything with um, riprap or hydrology. So that that's really interesting. Um, and so my question is kind of, you, you mentioned the cost per linear foot um, and um, I'm assuming and, uh, that essentially you're, I guess my question is like, how, what kind of volumes are we talking about per year that are sort of needed to stabilize the current road system? And, you know, are, are the, are we sort of slowly losing ground on that or does it depend on the year or how, how does that all work in terms of the sort of typical operating budget to replace? Yeah, it depends on the year. Uh, the last couple of years we haven't done any, uh, but there for a while we were, doing it every couple of years. So um, <clears throat> that $2,000 a lineal foot, that was that place I mentioned in uh, the Butte area where the, we, uh, or maybe I didn't mention that <clears throat> when we, I first went out and looked at it when I was first notified by our maintenance people, they had a steel rod that was like a half inch um, uh, diameter and it was 12 feet tall and so we thought, well, this will be good. We could, so we put that in and measured the depth to the bottom of the Matanuska River at that location. And it went to the bottom and we had one foot on top. So that it was 11 feet of erosion. And so that's why that was probably more expensive than others because that the erosion was pretty deep in that location. That was deeper than most. Um, so, so what would be a more typical cost? Oh, well, under sixteen hundred, eighteen hundred dollars a lineal foot, something like that. Of course, that's um, in old with old figures. So maybe today it would be two thousand. Um, uh, but that's that's what we paid then. That's the most we've ever paid per lineal foot. Um, and and how many like linear feet? Um, are, are susceptible to this? Well, of, it depends. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> that section in the Glen Highway, about the old Glen Highway, we've had actually had two projects there. And the total was probably um, uh, 12, 13, 1400 feet, something like that. Uh, the one, the last one we did, uh, I recommended like 900 feet and uh, uh, DOT management uh, didn't really want to believe that. And so they 
talked the core into going out and the core told them the same thing. <laughs> so maybe now they're going to believe me uh, more than, than, but it's expensive, you know, to get, to key the rock in down below the, the expected scour elevation. And that's, that is an estimate because, uh, because of these factors I mentioned before that uh, it depends on the change in the velocity vector. And that happens when uh, the water runs into a log that happens to be there or, or, or for whatever reason, it's changing direction. Um, so you can't really predict that. So you can't put it deep one spot and not in another spot. You just have to do the whole thing. And normally these, we use class, what we call class three riprap, which is two foot diameter, they're angular. So you need a minimum of two thicknesses. So that's four feet thick on a two to one slope, a one and a half to one uh, theoretically is stable, but there's really no safety factor. So I always use two to one. Um, uh, sometimes uh, we put in a, a uh, filter a blanket behind uh, the riprap because if the uh, natural material is too small, it'll get sucked out as the water flows through or by the riprap. So you need to keep that from happening by putting in uh, sometimes geotextile and sometimes uh, a layer, a, a cobbly layer, something like that. Okay. And I didn't mention that. Um, there's a question from uh, James Peterson. He said, do you ever incorporate logs, root wads, or other woody materials into the armoring? Uh, we do sometimes. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, normally, normally, if we're going to do that, uh, we put it into a uh, meandering stream where it's not as aggressive. Um, at least that's my, my strategy. Um, uh, originally when um, uh, Fish, Department of Fish and Game wanted us to use um, uh, root wads, we were a little bit skeptical because these are logs and they're going to rot and, and, and how long are they going to last? Well, so we've been doing that for 20 years now, probably, maybe, maybe a little longer. And we found as long as we use spruce, they tend to work very well. So we use it along um, uh, mea meandering streams where you get more parallel flow because uh, the uh, root wads have gaps between them. And I don't think they'd be uh, as, as good a rose protection as this riprap, continuous riprap, uh, in a braided stream. Uh, the, in a meandering stream, the water tends to flow more parallel to the bank. And so these root tines um, tend to slow the water down and fish and game likes them because the small fish can get behind those and, um, and, when they're, and, and hide e easier than if, it's, if, it's, uh, if they're not there. So we've been doing root wands. I don't like to do it in braided rivers for those reasons, but yeah, those work very well. Um, uh, there's a design strategy for that. You gotta make sure the logs are locked together. They're not moving individually, especially during breakup. Um, yeah, and when the ice moves. How does that um, root wads affect the cost? Does that decrease it or? It's probably a little cheaper. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, we, we do put a rock down at the toe, but it's, the rock is not from the stream bed up to the, the bank. It's just in the toe area generally. A um, couple other questions um, uh, from my friend Garrett Yeager. I'm uh, gonna I'm gonna go ahead and slide in here real quick. Oh, are we and just, no, we're not. But the the password for the the survey oh, yeah. today is is rivers. So just wanted to throw that out there. But yeah, you go ahead, Scott. Okay, rivers with an S, and I'm assuming that's either all, all, all lowercase, all lowercase. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Andy. Um, 
Can you comment on your success or lack thereof of using launching toes to store excessive riprap at the toe of a revetment to limit in channel work? Uh, any ROT for braided versus meandering for launching toes? Uh, yeah, we use uh, launching toes. I've had success for those. Um, a launching toe, for those who don't know, rather than keying the rock in, which means digging a hole below the stream bed and filling it with rock on a two to one slope, uh, launching toe is you put the rock on the stream bed and when the stream erodes underneath that, it falls into the hole. Of course, it doesn't go exactly where you want it. It, is in, it stays generally in the area, but it's not quite as, as good as placing it right where you want it, right? Like we've had some success. I don't really want to do that in a braided stream because um, uh, because I'm afraid we're gonna, the, the toe's not gonna launch or be continuous. Um, in a meandering river, that's not quite as much a concern, but we've had some success with that. Um, it's a little bit cheaper to construct. And so that's another reason rather than digging that hole. Uh, Did that great. answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Um... And then another question, uh, given the dynamic nature of the Matanuska River, how do you compute the forces against the bank to support sizing the riprap? Is it based on models or experience? Um, <clears throat> there's some um, approximations done. Um, with braided rivers, I've uh, decided to use what we call class three riprap, which is this two foot size rock and stuck with it because the impinging flow or the flow perpendicular into the, <clears throat> into the rock can happen anywhere. And I'm afraid the, the smaller rock is not gonna be adequate. It's so expensive to do it. We might as well do it with a little bit of a safety factor. And with the class three riprap that I've used ha has always been successful. So I'm afraid I'm afraid to go with smaller rock. Um, but yeah, if you had, didn't have some, some critical infrastructure, like normally for me, it's a road uh, or an airport, um, we, we could try it. Um, uh, <clears throat> but of course, that when I do these designs, I put my injuring seal on drawings and sign it. So I I'm, I'm, tend to be a little bit cautious. I don't want anybody to get killed and I don't want to be taken to court. Uh, yeah, I so I'm assuming that the cost differential for changing the size of the riprap to downsize it is, is you know, negligible, like 10% or something. Yeah, the, it's probably not, uh, it, it'd be lower, but it probably is not real significant. Yeah, I think you're right. <clears throat> okay. And it's really uh, hard to calculate the forces because you get these impinging flows The uh, in these braided rivers, the water can turn perpendicular into the bank uh, uh, due to various constraints. And it's not like a meandering stream where you normally have just parallel flow along the bank. That's a lot different. Well, and can you, you can't even really calculate your flow either, right? Cause you don't know how much water is going to be in that particular right. stream. Yeah. Yeah. It's it tough. All of it. It, yeah. could be none, it could be a quarter of the total volume of water. Yeah. Yeah. The channel width and the change in velocity. Mm -hmm. So the discharge and change in velocity like that rho Q delta V force. Yeah. Those are the criteria. Yeah. Get out your dartboard, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so I've been using class three on braided rivers and that's been successful. So I, I'm probably not going to change with uh, meandering streams are different. Uh, it's more parallel flow. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit different. Okay. Well, uh, we're, uh, we're about out of time and we're out of questions too. So it worked out well. So, okay, good. Um, thank you very much, uh, Paul. And, um, hopefully everybody learned something. I know I did. Um, and, um, 
yeah, again, that password for the PDH code is rivers with an S. And um, yeah, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your Friday.